It's 1870, and a samurai has just started a trading operation in a Japan still coming to grips with the modern world. Through hard work, ingenious engineering, and perhaps more than a little war profiteering, that company would later grow to be Mitsubishi, one of the four largest companies in one of the world's four largest economies. Mitsubishi is responsible for some of the most successful, most iconic, and most tuned cars of the 20th century. At its peak, it was behind seven Dakar Rally wins, four World Rally Championships, shoutouts in Wu-Tang Clan songs, a key role in the Fast and Furious, virtually an entire Jackie Chan movie, and sold 346,000 cars in a single year. In the mid-2000s, Mitsubishi seemed like it was on top of the automotive world. It had a clear brand identity and a loyal fan base. So how did sales plummet to just 15% of their peak in a few short years? How did the company watch Volkswagen's Dieselgate unfold and then top it? And is Mitsubishi responsible for the trend of naming mid-sized crossovers after once iconic performance models? All that and more on today's Pass Gas as we learn about the rise and fall of Mitsubishi. Fast Gas Podcast. It's about cars, it's not about ports. Big thank you to our sponsor this week, Valvoline Motor Oil. Extended protection, full synthetic, high mileage is Valvoline's best performing motor oil ever for engines with more than 75,000 miles. Be like us at Donut and put Valvoline in your car today. You can get it wherever you get your fine motor oil. Valvoline Motor Oil. Thank you. Is this our first episode ever to start with a samurai? I think so. Uh, yeah. I think that's a pretty good sign, gentlemen. I mean, we've mentioned feudal Japan in most of our episodes. But oh, yeah. Uh, we try and make a point of it. Yeah. Big time feudal first Japan. First samurai, though. Fans uh, right here. They actually made a Jackie Chan edition Evo 3 with a little plaque that said Jackie Chan on Dude, it. They that is a get. Yeah. <laughs> if one of those popped up on Top Rank or... Oh yeah, bring a trailer yeah. or something. I would, I'd look at it. I, look I would. At it. I would click on that I'd link for sure. I bookmark it. How much do you think that Jackie Chan bump is worth? Oh, I'd say you add 30, 40 grand. If you get he, signed by the. the he man. only used rally art cars in his movies. Did you know that? In I, all of his movies, did yeah. not know that. He had a Pajero Evo in one of in Operation Condor. What about Rush Hour? Rush, Rush Hour, Hour. He drove a Mitsubishi Montero Cross Sport. Oh. Convertible. <laughs> Sick. Cool. <laughs> Welcome back to Pass Gas, everybody. My name is Nolan Sykes. I'm joined by my co-hosts. We got James Pumphrey. Hey, what's up, guys? And Joe Weber. It's a me, a Joe. And we have a special guest in the studio with us today, Justin Freeman. Welcome to the show. Justin. Hello. And my special guest, of course, we mean good friend that we see every day <laughs> yeah. but we were like hey justin come sit and talk to us over here for yes. the next hour yeah i'm only allowed in the office if i bring my dog with me yeah yeah <laughs> edgar his dog is under the table in hanging my out with us today we're talking about one of the most iconic brands i would say uh it's a it's a tough one to talk about because i would say they're they're kind of like a they're a, f uh, a foundational brick in like the tuner donut absolutely. lore. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Mitsubishi yeah. confuses the heck out of me. Yes. They, they really do. Yeah. They were such, yeah, like you said, they were such a part of the foundation of people our age getting into cars. Definitely. You know, there's a number of Mitsubishis. You got Evos, you got Eclipses, mm -hmm. you got uh, GT 3000s, yeah. AKA, G, AKA GTOs. Mm -hmm. GTO, yep. But yeah. not. So much anymore. No. Yeah. no. And apparently something bad happened to them recently. But they did just announce 25. They're coming out with 25 new models by Ooh. 2025. Are <laughs> any of them cars? Uh, Probably What's not. your definition of a car, dude? <laughs> it like seems a, like, like a really a odd business decision. Car. Yeah, I know. It's very <laughs> like, does weird. anybody else make 25 cars? That's a lot. Uh, like, does Mercedes make 25 cars? Does Ford make 25 Oh, Mercedes cars? absolutely does. Yeah, I think Mercedes 25, does. 25, yeah. You did yeah. choose probably maybe the worst. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, chose, I chose the one that makes dump trucks and supercars. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and, yeah. But yeah, and besides Mercedes, uh, yeah. probably everyone else, yeah, everyone, it seems like everyone else is kind of paring down their lineups these days. So 25 is kind of yeah. amazing. Justin, how do you feel about Mitsubishi's? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, they 
growing up, they were the tuner car. They were it was the entry car on Need for Speed Underground. Yeah, it was the car in Fast and the Furious. Mm -hmm. uh, they're also really good with off road stuff. You know, it was just like, why would you give that up? You yeah. know what I mean? It's just really weird. The, it doesn't make a lot of money. They made all. Well, they had stuff all wheel drive. You yeah. know, like not many people were doing that. My friend Ilya, you met Ilya, Nolan? Yes. He he drove a not not an Evo but a Lancer. Mm -hmm. Did he and, try to make it an Evo? No, oh. he didn't know what it was. You okay. know, he, uh, but me who had just played a ton of Gran Turismo, I was like, yeah. oh yeah, Lancer. Yeah. And it was just <laughs> so bad. It was <laughs> horrible. I I know a guy named Ben. Shout out, Shout ben. out ben. Yeah, ben. Ben. Ben Shambach. Ben, ben Shambach. <laughs> he, uh, he only buys yellow Lancers. <laughs> That's really specific. Huh. Yeah. And he had he had a base model yellow, like, 2003 Lancer. And this is the kind of guy that'd be like, hey, dude, you want to wrench today? Uh -huh. And it's like, yeah, dude, come on out. And we have a bonfire and everything. But he never, like, wrenches with anyone. He just tears his car apart, <laughs> like fully disassembles his transmission, puts a new gear in, throws it all back together in a matter of four hours, puts it back in his car. Dude, this was fun. Drives off. What? Like, what? <laughs> Is he on meth? <laughs> I don't know. He's He was a homeschooled guy, so maybe, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but um, one day we're at work, and we're scrolling Facebook Marketplace, as we do, you know. This is before Donut. Uh, and uh, we find a rally art yellow Lancer. Oh. And he's just like, that's an upgrade from the base model. He literally leaves work and goes and <laughs> buys it. <laughs> and then now he's driving an upgrade. You there know? you go. And then. Um, that one came with the Oz wheels. Yes, exactly. Had, had metal, it all. Had, had it all. Had a spurler. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that was pre-Evo in the States. Were those still front wheel drive or all wheel drive? Front, front. Front. Still front. Only the Evo, I think, got all. I see. So now we're trying to find him a yellow, a yellow Evo. <laughs> he's gonna pay fifty thousand yeah, dollars. Yeah. <laughs> right. This one's a little harder to take apart and put back together. <laughs> Extra pieces. I need to call my guy. <laughs> Yataro Iwasaki wanted to be a samurai. Born in 1834 to a family of peasants who lived, quote, scraping the bottom of the rice bowl. Yataro's family had been members of the samurai warrior nobility only a few generations before, but were forced to sell off their status to pay off debts during the Great Tenmai Famine. But despite the family's hardships, Yataro's hardworking mother made it possible for him to get an education despite a rarely sober father. Quote, little is known of his childhood, but sources agree on his native intelligence and extreme mischievousness. Ooh. Gets into trouble, climbs trees with a slingshot. <laughs> Samurai stuff. <laughs> By his early... By his early adulthood, Yataro had scrounged enough money to buy the title of a lesser samurai, opening up more opportunities for him. You, I don't. You buy titles? You can just buy samurai. Yeah, what the heck does that mean? Why can't we do that now? <laughs> well, there might be a site that you could pay to. Those are get scams. That. Yeah. <laughs> the world Yataro was born into had more in common with the Middle Ages than with the steam-powered modern Japan that Yataro eventually helped build. Japan in 1834 was still in what historians call the Edo period, which had begun well over 200 years earlier. Japan was a feudal society, with peasants working the land for local feudal lords. Lords depended on the shogun for samurai, the ultimate source of military and political power. The samurai, loyal to the shogun, ensured that it was the shogun and not the emperor who was the de facto head of Japan. Edo society was, perhaps predictably, very strict. So strict that his father landed in jail after a particularly wild drinking binge. Yotaro himself was sent to prison for seven months for insinuating a local official could be bribed. Oh, wow. That's a weird Japanese trope, the, the drinking dad that does nothing but drink. And it's just like, how do you, how do you afford stuff? <laughs> you know? After uh, I'll talk to you after the... <laughs> <laughs> After prison and while working as a tutor, Yotaro met a local samurai, Toyo Yoshida, who was under house arrest for allegedly slapping another <laughs> samurai. <laughs> I challenge you to a duel. You, uh, you can't leave your house, man. <laughs> You're just slapping too much. <laughs> the two became fast friends, and Yoshida's progressive politics and interest in opening the then-closed Japan to industry and foreign trade led to Yotaro's further disenchantment with feudal society. 
After a political reshuffle in 1859 put Yoshida back in power, Yotaro was brought along as a clerk to learn the workings of the Japanese government. Though Yoshida was unfortunately assassinated in 1862, Yotaro was eventually able to buy back his family's samurai status. When the revolution came in 1867, Yotaro was friendly with the anti-shogun side. So, when the shogun was eventually overthrown, Yotaro began to buy up ships of all shapes and sizes, knowing that the new government would be much more sympathetic to foreign trade than the old one. It sounds like insider trading to me. Because <laughs> he knows what's coming. Dude, yeah. sounds, you're going to get slapped if yeah. you keep talking about him like this. Yeah. <laughs> sounds like insider trade. Oh, oh, this is going down. I'm going to buy some ships. These you know, gates are opening up. Some people might just call that prudent. Uh, yeah, because it's just reading the room. Um, <laughs> you, he started disassembling the ships and putting them back together again with his friends. <laughs> <laughs> By 1873, Yataro had struck out on his own with a new company named Mitsubishi. The Mitsubishi logo of three diamonds is a blend of the crests of noble families Yutaro worked for before founding the company. Mm. Don't you miss logos that actually mean something? I like a, a bland font that looks like everyone else, you know? Yeah, I love the crypto.com yeah, I want center a font. Dot .etf after the company name. That's what mm -hmm. I like. Yeah, I like just like sans serif. <laughs> yeah. Just simple. Slightly yeah. modified Helvetica with dot com is really just sells it. <laughs> Helvetica heavy in like a non descript blue. Yeah. Remember when James oh Cameron goodness. used the uh Papyrus? Papyrus. Papyrus. <laughs> yeah. Really funny uh <laughs> SNL sketch with Ryan Gosling. Yes, yeah. very good. Very good. Uh, if you guys haven't heard of Ryan Gosling, yeah, go check, check him out. Go check him out. Young up yeah. and comer. Yeah. Um He's really good at movies. Really good stuff. Very stoic. He's in this little <laughs> sci fi called Blade Runner twenty forty nine. Yeah, yeah he's uh, going to subscribe the to pines. his movies. Yeah. <laughs> Yotaro quickly became notorious for the extravagances he used to woo competitors and clients alike. Champagne, geisha, fine foods, and flattery were just a few of the tools at Yataro's disposal. Born at the wrong time. <laughs> <laughs> the tactics worked, James. Yataro's empire began at just 11 ships, but in less than 15 years, he would come to control more than 80% of shipping in Japan and vanquish American and British shipping companies in competition for foreign routes. Whoa. Mitsubishi's reputation during these years was like many Gilded Age companies in the U.S., when competition appeared, Mitsubishi cut rates so low that no company could possibly remain profitable. So it was only Mitsubishi's deeper pockets that kept it from bankruptcy. After engaging in a vicious rate war, the Japanese press dubbed Yotaro the sea monster and tried to influence the public and government to curb his power. This is when you get a full body tattoo. <laughs> yeah, dude. I am the sea monster. Oh, man, man. That's I'm the, the Kraken. That's a sick nickname. Um, I just learned this might be obvious to you guys at the table and listeners. When you see like a bunch of uh of the same like franchise in the in a tight area, yeah, uh, -huh. uh that just means that they're just trying to strangle the the local competition, the family owned mm. stuff. Ugh. So like like the joke about like a Starbucks across yeah. from a Starbucks. It's not on accident. No, it's They're a strategy. Just... They're gonna close one of those. But things. what yeah. what about mattress firm? <laughs> can we talk about know. mattress can firm we talk finally? About that? I don't know. I don't like, think we can. I think we're a Helix family. Helix. I did when I was in uh <laughs> where was that? Not, it was just outside Car no, it was Carlsbad, New Mexico. There is they have just one long street that goes all through town. And there was a Domino's at each end and one in the middle. Mm. And I saw that. And I was like, I bet there's no local pizza shops here anymore. Yeah. We, Shout out Carlsbad. Man, where us. am I going to get my Christmas pizza in New Mexico? <laughs> anyway, back to uh, <laughs> Yotaro here. It was time, not government regulation, that would best Yotaro. The founder of Mitsubishi was born into a world of feudal lords, shoguns, samurai, and warring clans. He died in 1885 leaving behind a Japan that was firmly in the grip of the industrial world, one that he himself helped to build. You know what I just realized is he did exactly what America did 100 years later, mm -hmm. which was kind of just like cut off uh, international trading power. But it was, you know, like the American car companies that were kind of curbing Japanese car sales in America. Uh -huh, with like protectionism. Mm -hmm. Chicken tags. Yeah. 
chicken yeah. tax. Chicken tax. But imagine that life, though. You went from a samurai to an industrial god. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah, <laughs> I think about that sometimes. What like what it must have been like to be like my grandparents, you know, who were born in like the nineteen during the depression, yeah, mid twenties, yeah, and you just see technology just boom i mean yeah well, i mean we are doing that right now yeah but we're gonna be it's, replaced it's by not AI. as drastic we're watching it. it's not as drastic are you kidding me i don't think so technology jumping right now is insane it's never been like i this do before. think it's it I don't, I don't know it, it's maybe like the, industry like in industry. industrial type stuff may have been a no little, but like he's dude technology is jumping like you're right like at, we've, a, at a pace that has not even come we've close made more technical technological advances in the last 10 years than they did in like the last 200 years like i'm legitimately mm. scared that none of us are going to have jobs in the next decade yeah that's like, a good concern. Yeah, our jobs chat. are all going to be fake but should have learned how to swing a hammer people, when like but <laughs> there's robot hammer swingers yeah oh my goodness and they're so we're doomed. Doomed. but like what's the point what I don't want to go down it, but like, there's just gonna be AI serving a bunch of poor people because mm. they took all it. They're turgardurs. But all we gotta do is get squirt guns. That's true. Because <laughs> they're not waterproof. Oh no, we didn't waterproof. <laughs> it's salt water. Yeah, salt, salt water. water we, we'll salt just have water. to move to the ocean. That's all. Yeah, we moved Ooh. to the ocean. Is it death clock into the water? Into the, yeah. <laughs> Live there, die there. Big thanks to Indeed for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. Hiring for your business can feel harder than trying to get any of the cars in our parking lot working. It's not going to happen, okay? But thanks to Indeed, hiring top talent just got top tier easy. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Don't spend hours on multiple job sites looking for candidates with the right skills when you can just do it all with Indeed. Find top talent fast with Indeed's suite of powerful hiring tools like matching, assessments, and virtual interviews. Look, I'm going to talk about one of my favorite Indeed features, which is Indeed Matching. Makes the hiring process so much easier. With Indeed Matching, as soon as you sponsor a post, you get a short list of quality candidates whose resumes on Indeed match your job description. Indeed does the hard hiring work for you. That's why I like Indeed so much. Indeed knows when you're growing your own business, you have to make every dollar count. That's why with Indeed, you only pay for quality applications that match your must-have job requirements. Visit indeed.com slash passgas to start hiring now. Just go to indeed.com slash passgas. Indeed.com slash passgas. Terms and conditions apply. Cost per application pricing not available for everyone. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Thanks, Indeed. <laughs> Mitsubishi thrived for the next 70 years, eventually becoming one of the largest four companies in Japan. During this time, the Japanese economy was dominated by the Zayabatsu, wealthy clicks. Ooh. Anyone yeah. play Tekken? Dude, well, dude, that's like a Pusha T song or something. Like, I got yeah. wealthy clicks. <laughs> I got Zayabatsu. <laughs> Zayabatsu money, wealthy clicks. <laughs> You are hiding a child. <laughs> <laughs> these wealthy cliques controlled virtually all aspects of said economy. The power of these Zayabatsu companies can be approximated by comparing them to now broken up companies like Standard Oil or U.S. Steel. So they were like monopolies, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, Mitsubishi was alone in having diversified ventures in areas like banking, insurance, mining, warehousing, aircraft, steel, and real estate. What yeah. does the aircraft market look like back then? Um, and the it was 18, during... Oh, this is, yeah. a, this is during World War One. So 1911s, yeah, little biplanes, open little air, biplanes. Red Baron type stuff. Yeah, Speaking probably. of pizza. Uh, yeah. God, yeah. I'm getting hungry. I want to go to a sit-down Red Baron. <laughs> <laughs> Just plain bl blueprints all over the wall. <laughs> you know what I don't understand is, sorry, this is a tangent, but Papa Murphy's. Why, Can we talk about Papa Murphy's? <laughs> why would I want to go buy a pizza that's not cooked so I can oh go cook it at my house. That sounds like a um, Kramer from Seinfeld business idea. Yeah. Yes. Like, what's the it... best part of the pot? People when it's fresh. You know, a <laughs> lot of people. Gonna, they got to cook the pie? <laughs> <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> <laughs> then, like, George's dad gets on with him. Yeah. Why would they want to cook their own pizza? <laughs> you're, you're paying it. It's a stupid idea. You need to believe in me. Not again. <laughs> oh my god. It's 
It's like I'm there. Yeah. <laughs> I did not watch Seinfeld. <laughs> <laughs> you would have loved it. You would love it. So. You wouldn't believe how many Papa Murphy apologists are out there, though. Yeah. <laughs> and it was during this period that Mitsubishi first began to make automobiles, dipping its toe into the market with the 1917 introduction of the Model A. If you're thinking that sounds like a Model T uh, or a Ford Model A, you'd be right. The Model A looked very similar to Ford's Model T, but it was based on a Fiat rather than a Ford. Hmm. This four-door, seven-seat sedan was powered by a 35-horsepower motor and was designed to shuttle politicians and businessmen around in style. 35 horsepower was pretty good for back then. Yeah, not bad. Yeah. However, the focus on wealth and luxury proved too effective. As long build times and high prices, the entire rear compartment was finished in lacquered white cypress. Ooh. Uh, meant that only 22 were ever made. It doesn't take that long for me to lacquer white cypress. <laughs> yeah, but you've been doing it forever. Yeah. Hey, they didn't have the, the tools we have. A paintbrush? <laughs> <laughs> Spray guns. Uh, but Mitsubishi's best-known product during this period was the A6M0. Ooh, I've heard of this guy. Um, if any of you served in World War II... Uh, especially in the Pacific Theater, you may have, be familiar with these if any of our listeners are World War II veterans. First flown in 1939, this was the empire of Japan's workhorse carrier fighter aircraft for the duration of the war. In all, over 10,000 would be built. Movie fans may remember Hiro Horikoshi, the Mitsubishi employee most responsible for the design of the Zero, as the subject of Miyazaki's 2013 film, The Wind Rises. American occupation of Japan following World War II spelled the end for Mitsubishi and the Zaibatsu. Each company was broken up into much smaller pieces, which meant they had less political capital. But these new entities, called Karitsu, would still maintain close business relationships with each other although each component was independently owned and operated. And thus, Mitsubishi was broken up into four main companies. Mitsubishi Corporation, Mitsubishi Electric, MUFG Bank, and Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. The last of these, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, is where we really get to the cars. I love the Heavy Industries moniker. It's so Dude, it's so sick. sick. Yeah. It's hard. Dude, we should make a donut shirt that says Donut Heavy Industries. That's That'd be it. dope because Subaru is also uh, Fuji Heavy yeah, Industries. Yeah, Fuji Heavy yeah. Industries. Uh. Donut Heavy Industries. Just really thick t-shirts. Dude, it's like an 11-pound <laughs> yeah. hoodie. Uh, that's Bunch of it's like a weighted blanket. Yeah, a weighted blanket. A weighted hoodie? A have weighted hoodie, that? hoodie would be sick. Oh, that, oh, would that be brain so dead comforting. hoodie I have is like six and a half pounds. What? I love it. I don't, not really. Probably. It feels heavy, though. Cheap labor and American investment in Japan brought on a post-war economic miracle that created a rapidly expanding middle class, and with it, the demand for more automobiles. Smaller companies like Nissan and Toyota, which had not been part of the Zaibatsu, had already gotten a head start on the car industry, with both companies exporting cars by 1959. Mitsubishi, eager to regain its place in the sun, responded in 1960 with the introduction of its first car since the Model A, the 500. Mitsubishi's racing heritage began soon after with the little 594 cubic centimeter engine car taking first, second, third, and fourth places in the under 750cc category at the 1962 Macau Grand Prix. By American standards, these cars were tiny, smaller than the original Minis or Beetles, but Mitsubishi wasn't done yet. The company continued building out its automotive line with K-cars, K-trucks, compacts, executive cars, and vans. Uh, Mitsubishi's prowess in Japan hit a high mark in 1971 when the Mitsubishi Colt F2000 won the 1971 Japanese Grand Prix at Fuji. It was around this time, 1970, that the Mitsubishi Motors Company was created as we know it today. You know, we talked about uh, Carol Shelby's, like, Dodge years. Mm-hmm. When he had that weird charger in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. Wasn't that like a Colt, a Mitsubishi Colt? Colt F2000 sounds like so many different things. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think there was a there was a Dodge Charger Mitsubishi. Yeah. Yeah. There I saw one Dodge at Redwood. Colt. Yeah, there's a Dodge Colt, but there's there was the Mitsubishi Charger yeah. that was built by Mitsubishi. It has all Mitsubishi badges and stuff. Weird. 
have a picture. And of we'll it. talk about Diamond Star Motors later as well, which is another Chrysler Mitsubishi collab. DSM. Mm-hmm. Oh, BDSM. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Mitsubishi was feeling itself. It had a full range of cars for sale. It was fresh off a Grand Prix win and was ready to compete with the big boys. In the early 1970s, that meant going to the heart of car culture, the North American market. In 1971, Mitsubishi entered into a deal with Chrysler in which Chrysler would purchase a 15% stake in Mitsubishi Motors, import the Mitsubishi Galant, and resell it as the Dodge Colt. Told ya. Bing bong. <laughs> That's called foreshadowing and good podcasting. Great job, guys. We did it. Yay. Perhaps the most famous fruit of this partnership was the 1978 to 83 second generation Dodge Challenger, <laughs> which was really a rebadged Mitsubishi Galant Lambda. Good stuff, Challenger. We were wrong. We said Charger. It was a Challenger. Lambda. You guys were close. While the advent of the catalytic converter and consumer demand for better fuel economy made horsepower ratings plunge across the auto industry, the once proud Dodge Challenger marquee saw the lowest power levels in its history, with the standard engine outputting 77 horsepower and the optional Hemi engine making only 105 horsepower. We swapped the weakest Hemi into our Challenger. <laughs> but the car is that a four-cylinder Hemi? It, uh, I don't know. Uh, Dude, Glunt Lambdas are pretty cool. Surprisingly, though, the car was a success. But uh, relations between Chrysler and Mitsubishi were less than excellent. Chrysler was perturbed that Mitsubishi was competing against it in non-U.S. markets, while Mitsubishi felt that Chrysler, then in its era of pre iacocca malaise, was getting in the way of competing <laughs> with the larger car brands it viewed as upstarts. pre iacocca malaise sounds like a sauce. <laughs> <laughs> Chrysler was so Another devoid shirt. of ideas that it resorted to paying Neil Armstrong to huck its car's warranties on TV. The so warranties? The yeah. Not even the cars. <laughs> the warranties. So This will who, get you to the moon and back. Yeah. <laughs> so who could blame Mitsubishi for wanting to break free from them? Although it still supplied badge-engineered cars to Chrysler, Mitsubishi longed to compete with Honda, Toyota, and Nissan on its own terms. It wanted to enter the U.S. market under its own name. They finally did so in 1982, but with a whimper instead of a bang. Mitsubishi had just 70 dealers in 22 states. And for context, Ferrari currently has 67 dealers in 21 states. And even Mitsubishi now, a shadow of its former self, has at least 300 dealers. One of those in, in downtown L.A. You can go get yourself a new Mirage. With those numbers, Mitsubishi was miles behind their fellow Japanese brands. But they wanted to get bigger. So when it came to North America in the 80s, Mitsubishi came in with everything they had. Compacts, subcompacts, midsize sedans, sports cars, minivans, SUVs, and even a truck. Despite fewer dealers, Mitsubishi sold well where they were available. In a decade where car culture was dominated by Grand Nationals, Exotics, and DeLoreans, a quiet revolution was brewing. Mitsubishi was getting ready for its golden age, and it began in the vastness of the Sahara. They, their truck was like a little car truck, right? Uh, I'm not even familiar with Because the they, they did a Dodge one as well. Oh, yeah, that's what the D50 was. Yeah. The Dodge D50 was like a Mitsubishi little baby truck baby baby guy like yeah it's the mitsubishi manly max yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was the was the um the dodge what was it the raider or whatever the little yeah, like front wheel drive ute or yeah whatever? it had a crazy name oh, the rampage. Ramp- no rampage, rampage. rampage. There you go. rampage. the raider is actually dodges stealing the um the montero yes that was their mm. theft of that yeah their That's theft, cool. they broke into the mainframe. They're like, oh, that, that's doing pretty well out Dodge there in those deserts. Let's Why don't we do a collab? We do all the <laughs> car stuff well, and we'll just put our badge on it. What movie is it? Is it? Rampage is a little truck. Yeah. 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 Henry Dude, wants one really sick. bad. Dude, there's a clean one in my neighborhood, a little, little silver one. I want to... I want to not buy that. And <laughs> it's cool like to look at. Improv mystery show on Netflix with Will Arnett. Oh, I like that show. His character drives like a super clean orange Dodge Rampage. Really? Yeah. <laughs> it's really funny. Henry's in love with him. I don't know why. I mean, I do. <laughs> <laughs> because Mitsubishi, I mean, it tracks. Yeah. 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 Totally tracks. Yeah. The X90. Uh, if you want to check out. 
Uh, Henry's Tasting Cars. He made a series of shorts on our YouTube channel. It's really good, really funny. With his Suzuki X X ninety X ninety. Yeah. Yeah. It's the curvy samurai. Yeah. It's like a Pretty sedan sick. little tall truck. It Oops. looks like a, a Honda Del Sol. It truck. looks like a stocky. Yeah, it looks, yeah, like, it looks stocky. like those uh, toys you used to get at Chevron. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or like it looks like you can pull it back and then let it go. And it yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Because Mitsubishi also produced clones of the Willys Jeep for the Japanese military from 1945 all the way to 1998, the company knew a thing or two about froding. I bought one of those off-roading vehicles. A new Jeep, uh, the Willys, <laughs> the Mitsubishi Willys. Yeah, this dude yeah. Uh, on a Volkswagen form that I was on bought like a newer Mitsubishi they're Willys. Dope. Yeah, they're they're, cool. they come diesel. Oh. Which is pretty sick. They used their froding knowledge to develop their Montero SUVs, which absolutely dominated the Dakar rally during their lifespan, securing a one-two finish at the 1985 Dakar. This motorsport success created a halo around the Montero in the U.S. market, helping Mitsubishi to sell 266,000 units by 1987. Jeez. Their dominance of Dakar didn't stop there. From 2001 until 2007, the Mitsubishi Montero won seven consecutive rallies. So, like in the states, it's called a Montero. The car that actually, or the truck that actually won, is the uh, Pajero. Pajero or yeah. Pajero. Pajero, yeah. Uh, and that's what it's called elsewhere. It's a it's a soft J. It, it could be. It depends on where you're from. Nobody no. knows. <laughs> <laughs> Just like Starion and Starion. <laughs> but uh, uh, Piero Evo. Damn. Is like just Google it. It's one of the coolest cars. Yeah, like, it's got fins. Yeah, it's got, it's fins. got a little spoiler. I'm looking at a wide clean body 2002 Montero. How much for 5,500 bucks? Yeah, what? Man. They're slept on. Yeah. Oh, it's <laughs> not the Evo though. It's not the Evo, but it looks pretty cool. Let me see. I mean, it's got really stupid wheels on it right now, but you could make that. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. They're three. They're yeah. essentially um, the. Toyota Sequoia. You could make it cool. Yeah, it's Jesse always talks about getting a Montero. They're great. But let's jump back to the 80s. Mitsubishi's full court press on the U.S. market faced an early problem. Because the U.S. auto industry had been getting decimated at the hands of cheap Japanese imports. So Japanese automakers voluntarily created an import restriction, capping the amount of cars that they could bring to the U.S. This was done to prevent excess regulation and increase taxes from the U.S. government. But for Mitsubishi, it meant that they couldn't sell as many cars. <laughs> <laughs> so they did what any Japanese automaker of the time would do. They just built them in the United States. Past Gas by Donut Media is sponsored by BetterHelp. Getting to know yourself can be a lifelong process, especially because we're always growing and changing and things in our life are affecting us in different ways. That's why therapy is so important. Therapy is all about deepening your self-awareness and understanding because sometimes we don't know what we want or why we react the way we do until we talk through things. Literally, therapy is just talking to someone. And BetterHelp is the best way to get into therapy for someone who has never done it before. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can take you on that journey of self-discovery from wherever you are. I think BetterHelp is the easiest way to get into therapy if you've never done it before. If you're thinking of starting therapy, all you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist at BetterHelp, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. That's why I really like BetterHelp. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash gas today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash gas. Thanks, BetterHelp. In 1988, Mitsubishi opened their factory in Normal, Illinois. <laughs> uh, don't yeah. be suspicious. Yeah, don't, don't be, be suspicious. suspicious. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you know, I was building a bunch of our normal towns. Cars normal. <laughs> normal cars. <laughs> uh, since they were still working with Chrysler, the facility was given a neutral name Diamond Star Motors. This factory would be the base of Mitsubishi's U.S. manufacturing operations and was capable of pumping out up to 200,000 eclipses, Eagle Talons, and Plymouth lasers a year from its opening 
until its 2015 closure. With a name like that, you think they'd be selling luxury vehicles. Diamond Star Diamonds Motors. and stars. Well, you're saying that a Plymouth Laser ain't a luxury vehicle? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> uh, Boy, toy. Let me get your caviar, Mr. Rockefeller. <laughs> my first I time, ordered oysters. My first time eating caviar was with you, James. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With this relief, uh, <laughs> the jig is up. <laughs> With this relief from the shackles of the import restriction, Mitsubishi was set to conquer the U.S. It had a diverse lineup of stylish cars that people wanted to buy, got shout-outs in Nas and Wu-Tang Clan songs, and sales were skyrocketing. In 1991, the company was freed from its import deal with Chrysler, though Mitsubishi continued making cars for Chrysler on a contractual basis. Mitsubishi's long-standing relationship with Jackie Chan also began to bear fruit during this period. Finally. Finally. Thank planted you. Planted seeds in Jackie Chan years ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you don't know, it's one of our favorite things. We mention it quite a bit. Jackie Chan had been sponsored by Mitsubishi, since the 70s. His movies would feature Mitsubishi's in exchange for free vehicles for those movies. <laughs> what a deal. That's yeah. sick. You know, I didn't know about the Jackie Chan Mitsubishi thing until, like, Donut said it. Uh -huh. And I was just like, it all makes sense yeah. now. <laughs> Perhaps the most beautiful, campy example of this is Chan's 1995 film, Thunderbolt. Jackie yeah. plays a Mitsubishi former test driver moonlighting as a tow truck operator slash crime fighter in Hong Kong. There's even a training montage at the Mitsubishi factory featuring an in-movie race team rocking Jackie Chan racing merch. Chan's rise to prominence during the 1990s further fueled interest in Mitsubishis, giving the brand the same cool factor on the street that the Pajero gave it in the dirt. But... Thunderbolt and Jackie Chan didn't create a tuner culture surrounding Mitsubishis. Evo in the street, Pajero in the dirt. <laughs> There's one. <laughs> what? what? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, there's one Jackie Chan movie where he drives a yellow Mitsubishi FTO. Oh, mm. yeah. So the one safe. we never got. Yeah. But Thunderbolt and Jackie Chan didn't create a tuner culture surrounding Mitsubishis. It reflected one. Cars like the Eclipse, Lancer, and Pajero came equipped with a tuner-friendly engine, the turbocharged Series 4G. The cylinder block was cast iron, not aluminum, which meant that it could accept more boost uh, before having to upgrade the internals. This plug-and-play capability, combined with the Eclipse's 90 styling, freaking bubbly-ass swooping lines, uh -huh. Love uh, plastic tape deck housings, made it an instant success. It looked different than everything in the whole planet. Yeah, it had that big uh, eclipse spoiler. Had a big eclipse spoiler. It just went whirp, whirp, whirp. whirp. Bump on the hood if it was a turbo one. Mm -hmm. That's like a core memory for me is going down El Camino Real into the Escadero and pulling up, being at a stoplight. You got to stop doxing yourself. And, uh,. <laughs> You just it's like parents. the main street in Tascadero. Stop uh, doxing your parents. <laughs> yeah, quit doxing this uh, silver. Scott, quit doxing Scott. <laughs> the silver <laughs> eclipse pulls up next to us with a big old spoiler, just like bumping the tunes, dude. Yeah. Just that Moby tunes. song, or the, the one where she's dancing uh, with the seatbelt from the Mitsubishi commercial. Oh, the one oh, Dave yeah. Chappelle made fun of. I've told this story a number of times, oh, yeah. but. Uh, one of the first girls I ever had in a car with me, I was driving, I had a S13 240 with oh, like yeah. the stock, like KA motor. So like the it's truck. a truck engine. Mm -hmm. It's not fast. Uh, but like I was like into cars and I was at a stoplight and these twins, like nerds, like tw <laughs> identical twin nerds with glasses. Red and hair like, or no? No. <laughs> crew cuts like NASA engineers, mm. uh, pulled up in a first gen Eclipse. And like, Sick. dude, if there's nerd twins that are sharing a car, <laughs> like there is no way that that car's not super fast. Mm -hmm. And like the girl I was with, her name Justin's was Cassie. Twin, Cassie. It's, the, it's the burden of being a yeah. twin. Yeah. You have yeah. to share if, if literally you, if everything. If you and your brother yeah. share a car, it's going to be a fast car. Yeah. Like, you're like, wow, let's make it, you know, it's twice. <laughs> And uh, two heads. And this gr the girl that I was with, again, one of the first times I ever was alone with a girl, probably. I went to a boys' school. Um, she leans out of the window. She goes, You want to race? 
And like in unison, their heads just like turn towards us. And they go, they at the same time, they both go, you're going to lose. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I was just like, they're right. Like, what are you doing? Did you know in those first gen uh, eclipses, the, the ones with the turbo, there was a dial where you can turn the turbo down. Whoa. And like, it would just sit idle and that's not sick. have boost. And then you crank it up. Oh, that's cool. That's, that's really cool. Crap. But yeah, these twins, these twin <laughs> geniuses smoked me. Yeah. <sighs> Your truck motor just trying as hard. <laughs> yeah, it's like, well, I got a little, I got torque, but just like the need, the tack is just like, <laughs> man, I'd give it all to go back. <laughs> <laughs> Trade it off for one more day. We actually have those twins coming in to guest yeah. on the next podcast. Yeah. Oh, God. We tracked them down. <laughs> if we're bringing in twins, I'll just get my brother here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The Eclipse was a natural competitor to cars like the Toyota Supra, um, the Mazda RX-7, and Nissan Z cars. It wasn't, it wasn't. Like, I feel like it, like, wasn't. It was a little bit slower. Well, it was, like, s- cheaper, too. Yeah, it and, gets mentioned in this, like, because we group them all together now, just, like, in, like, a retrospective of 90s cars. But, like, yeah, it was more expensive. Or, sorry, was more affordable. The Supra was, like, kind of a luxury car on the interior. Mm-hmm. Really I'd nice. say it was, like, more like a... 240SX or yes. Sylvia mm-hmm. competitor. The 3000 GT was more of like yeah, the that was their super GTR cool. kind of. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But then, but Nissan was so crazy because they had so many oh, six yeah. cylinders and turbos. Dude, they had insane cars in the 90s. Yeah. Again, I think both Mitsubishi and Nissan are kind of like, mm, if you make a bunch of cool stuff, you get about a decade to do it. Mm-hmm. And yeah. then you have to make tiny SUVs for the rest of your life to pay for it. <laughs> Pretty much. Neither of these companies. Uh, Nissan actually owned... Mitsubishi. Oh. Perhaps the most famous pop culture Mitsubishi is the one used towards the beginning of the Fast and the Furious. That massive winged lime green tuner car that Paul Walker loses to Vin Diesel. It's a 1995 Eclipse. Then it gets exploded. It gets exploded because of the NOS. Oh, no, my car just exploded. It. Oh, no, it's exploded. It. <laughs> you and me, a non exploded car. <laughs> <laughs> I said a non sploded car, not an almost sploded car. <laughs> and while we can't know how well Eclipse exhaust manifolds and passenger side footwells stand up to the rigors of NOS, we do know that 90s Mitsubishis were pretty reliable. Hmm. Racing Lancers wasn't just for the streets. In 1996, Tommy McKinnon beat Colin McRae and Carlos Sainz Sr. to take his First World Rally Championship title. This Those are title, some big names. Yeah, dude, that's a lot of three guys for one sentence. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's like a massive amount of three guys in one sentence, dude. When we were at Sonoma shooting the finale of uh, the WRX High Low, we blew a transmission up, and the shop we luckily found a shop that was going to swap like swapped it out for us in like three hours. But in their shop, they had uh, Tommy Micken in. Uh, Evo 6. Mm-hmm. Whoa. And it was left hand drive. Sheesh. Yeah, because it was from Hong Kong. Mm. Sick. We should go to Hong Kong. We should go to Hong Kong. Jackie Chan has a secret layer there. It was it's secret. Not- <laughs> 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 like, I'm not trying to dox Jackie Chan, but Production he's got a changes. cool, huge layer with a big garage. I want to, dude, we should go hang out with Jackie Chan. Yeah. For real. For like six months. This string of success in WRC and the Evo 7's appearance in Too Fast, Too Furious hyped up the Lancer Evo in the U.S. market. But the Evo wouldn't be released in the U.S. until well into the 2000s. Enthusiasts naturally wanted what they couldn't have. And hype around the car built. Uh, Ain't that the truth? Ain't that the truth? Things were going so well for Mitsubishi that rumors swirled about a possible purchase of fellow automotive giant Honda. Wow. Uh, Yeah, Honda wasn't doing great in the 1990s from a business perspective. Honda's over-engineered cars had much longer R&D times than comparable Nissan, Toyota, or Mitsubishi models, and it cost the company more to produce them. But Honda's then wildly successful venture into Formula One snapped funds and attention away from the actual balance sheet. 
This style of business was all good and well in the 1980s when the Japanese economy was booming, but quickly became a liability during the lost decade of the 1990s. Honda CEO Nobuhiko Kawamoto barely staved off the takeover attempt. Kawamoto, a former F1 Honda engineer, was forced to make the painful decision to leave F1 at the height of their power in order to avoid bankruptcy. Damn, that sucks. Yeah. Takeover is my least favorite word now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I'm watching a lot of succession and there's talk of hostile takeovers. Quite a bit. All the time. It's pretty much hostile takeover of the show. Yeah. <laughs> The company then introduced the popular CRV and cut down their R&D, choices that ultimately saved the company, but made their cars a little bit more boring to us. <laughs> well, you turn into the bug man from Men in Black. <laughs> Sugar water. Sugar. More. Sugar water. More. <laughs> Even though the takeover never came to pass, it's a testament to Mitsubishi's 1990s prowess and confidence that it felt it could take over what is now the world's single largest motor vehicle manufacturer. Mitsubishi ultimately reached its high water mark in the early 2000s. It sold over 340,000 vehicles in 2003, introduced the Lancer Evo 8 to the U.S. market, and its cultural cachet was at an all-time high. But then annual sales plummeted. What happened? Big thank you to our sponsor this week, Valvoline Motor Oil. Older cars need a motor oil that can handle the demands of aging engines. Once an engine passes 75,000 miles, the effects of wear, friction, heat, and deposits, they start to show. If engine parts aren't properly protected, they can wear down and lead to reduced gas mileage, lower horsepower, and a shorter engine life. And in the worst case scenario, your engine could freaking blow up. Most motor oils claim they protect against wear, but in some cases, the protective film can be thin and uneven, providing <sighs> inadequate protection. Luckily for you though, Valvoline Extended Protection Full Synthetic High Mileage Motor Oil provides the ultimate protection for engines with 75,000 miles or more. This is Valvoline's best high mileage motor oil ever. It extends the life of your engine by providing the ultimate protection against wear, friction, heat, and deposits, and it's 10 times stronger against oil breakdowns. Guys, if you've been listening to the show for a long time, you know that I have Valvoline in all of my cars, and if you don't have it in yours yet, what are you doing? Get the best on the market. Get Valvoline today. Thank you very much, Valvoline, for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. Scandal is what happened, James. And we're not talking about a rip off the Band-Aid, apologize and people will forget type scandal. We're talking about blunder after blunder after blunder after blunder (laughs) after blunder after plunder. So many that we don't actually have time to get through them all. Just know that by the end of it, Mitsubishi is going to look like Wile E. Coyote at the end of a Looney Tunes episode. A timely reference for our audience. (laughs) Yeah. And it'll be about as trustworthy as that cartoon. (laughs) Takamuni Kimura, Mitsubishi CEO, had a little bit of a Yakuza problem. Yakuza extortion of Japanese companies is a well-documented phenomenon. Japanese companies will pay individual members of the Yakuza, called Sokaya, to ensure that yearly meetings are not disrupted by Yakuza operatives and prevent corporate malfeasance from reaching the press. Turns out that Kimura had been pressured by Sequoia to pay up. He did so to the tune of about 23.5 million yen. Damn. Kimura had a reason to be afraid. In 1994, some Sequoia had stabbed Juntaro Suzuki to death with a katana outside his house after he stopped (sighs) payment. But it turns out that paying off mobsters to keep your company's name in good standing only works if nobody knows you're paying off these mobsters. A part of the process that didn't quite go Kimura's way. The mobsters were eventually arrested and disclosed the transaction, prompting Kimura to resign as the head of Mitsubishi in 1997. I, uh, I'm so glad I'm not behind on my katana payments. If there's something, <laughs> if there's something I don't want to be stabbed by, it's a, a katana outside my house. Yeah. That would suck. Stab me with a paring knife <laughs> in an alley, but not a katana not in front katana. of my house. That's a long blade. Kimura's replacement... Katsuhiko Kawasoe uh, didn't fare much better. Turns out that Mitsubishi had systematically covered up data about vehicle defects for the previous 30 years. Automobile recall specialists at the company would simply stamp defective complaints secret and then stuff them away in a locker at company headquarters. 
best way to ignore the problem is just to lock it away. Mm -hmm. Executives at Mitsubishi initially stated that the practice of covering up defects had been going on for only eight years. Only eight years? Katsuhika Kawasoi evidently didn't get this memo. He actually stated that illegal acts had taken place for a long time. That was a direct quote. Kawasoi was right about this and would actually continue to be right about it. He himself was arrested and later convicted of criminal negligence in the 2000s. The now required recalls cost the company an estimated $69 million. Nice. nice. And, <laughs> and while only 50,000 vehicles in North America were ultimately recalled, Mitsubishi's stock and credibility were severely damaged. Perhaps the only people less thrilled at this scandal than defective Mitsubishi drivers was Daimler Chrysler. In the months before the scandal, the company had taken a 34% stake in Mitsubishi. Daimler Chrysler had viewed its Mitsubishi acquisition as a step on the road to becoming a global automotive powerhouse that compete that could compete with the likes of General Motors and Volkswagen. And now they were second guessing their decision. Yet the defect scandal was not the only problem facing the company. Mitsubishi had run a marketing scheme to allow no payments whatsoever on the car for the first 12 months. I remember this. This meant that the company had to repo cars that both hadn't made a dime and now <laughs> mm. were worth less than they cost to make. Nice. This, combined with the East Asian financial crisis of 1997, had left Mitsubishi with an insane debt load. But Daimler Chrysler still persisted in buying up Mitsubishi. The structure of the deal allowed it to list the company's assets, but not all of its debts, making Daimler Chrysler the corporate equivalent of a mullet. Business in the front? Hmm. <laughs> party in the back i remember that commercial just be like oh you don't you can get finance right now you don't have to pay for a whole year and i was just like how do you make money <laughs> that's insane yeah like, what? Or you're thinking that. yeah <laughs> it didn't make sense unsurprisingly by 2004 the partnership was on the rocks debt continued to accumulate profitability remained elusive and mitsubishi's north american car sales had entered the aforementioned free fall Executives at Daimler Chrysler refused to bankroll the flailing company, <laughs> and ultimately the 69-month partnership between the brands, nice. with no bailout from Chrysler waiting in the wings, Mitsubishi Motors did what any rich kid would do. It turned to its parents for money, the original Mitsubishi Group Kairitsu. Mitsubishi Group invested 40 billion yen into the company in 2004, 70 billion more in 2005, and a final 30 billion yen in 2006. The investment and its accompanying revitalization plan worked, and Mitsubishi Motors turning a 20 million yen profit by 2008. But in North America, the damage had already been done. Mitsubishi's debt meant that less money was available to update their cars. A planned project to manufacture a cross-model car platform in North America, imaginatively named Project America, was scrapped. The project came shortly before Mitsubishi's restructuring and ultimate decision to focus its North American business on imported rather than bespoke models. And the result? A half-baked car platform that couldn't do anything well. Crossovers using the platform failed to meet sales figures. The Eclipse, once the savior of the tuner crowd due to its low weight, now faced reviews calling out its not-so-sporty proportions. It got real bad. Yes. Perhaps the lone bright spot on the North American Mitsubishi experience during this period was the introduction of the Lancer Evo. Mitsubishi easily could have cut bait on its Halo car in an era where profitability took precedence over track capability, but offered the Lancer Evo up to until 2017, in spite of low sales figures. However, the North American car market was moving away from all sedans, not just sporty ones. Crossovers overtook sedans mm -hmm. in the market share near the end of Lancer Evo's tenure, and today, Mitsubishi does not market a single sedan in the North American market. I remember in when the Evo 10 first came out, I forget, was that like 2009 or? Yeah, 2009, 09. 09. I remember that, like this junior at my high school uh, that was, he was like dating one of my buddies. Uh, got one. Mm. I have like no idea how he afforded that unless his parents were helping him pay for it which is likely mm -hmm. but at the same time he really uh, he he really leaned into being the evo guy oh really oh yeah what well, yeah. would you describe an evo evo guy well he was i remember he's probably like five four <laughs> like skinnier dude rocking like the zip up hoodie all the he, time he wore his hat under the hood he never 
he I don't drove think he with ever his hood up. The hat or the hood. He just oh. yeah. He was one of those zip up hoodie guys. <laughs> Sounds like any any loud exhaust guy with dark window tint. <laughs> if you thought Mitsubishi was done with scandals, they weren't guys. I fooled you. Ah. This time, Mitsubishi would finally get its wish to be bigger and better than an automotive titan, just not in the way the company wanted. Not steroids. In 2015, <laughs> not long after news broke that Volkswagen had been cheating on emission tests since 2009, Mitsubishi revealed that it actually had been cheating on their emission tests for the last 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> This, predictably... Wait, blood doping is bad? We've been doing it the whole time. <laughs> what? I thought it was part of the game. Predictably, this um, led to the... The EPA's team. right behind me, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you mean you guys weren't? <laughs> this, predictably, led to the discontinuation of offending models as well as the reg- resignation of top executives. This new scandal came to light around the same time that Nissan bought a 34% stake in Mitsubishi under a certain well-known CEO named Carlos Ghosn. In 2020, officials raided the Mitsubishi Frankfurt headquarters as part of their investigation into whether or not the company was selling diesel vehicles in Germany that were programmed to cheat on emissions tests. Spoiler alert, guys. Or should I say exhaust alert? Nice. They were. German prosecutors ultimately fined Mitsubishi just under $30 million. That's pretty cheap, though. Yeah, it's probably that just sounds like a price to pay. A much diminished Mitsubishi still has a presence in the US market. Mitsubishi states that it currently has over 300 dealerships in 46 states. It sold 85,510 cars in 2022. The brand offers essentially four models: the Outlander, the Outlander Sport, the Mirage, and the Eclipse Cross. One of these, the Outlander, is the best seller with 40,942 units sold last year. The brand's tuner heritage lives on with the Eclipse Cross, although in name only. Car and Driver called it nothing more than a run-of-the-mill compact SUV that fails to live up to its namesake. U.S. News was more blunt, calling it not a very good SUV. (laughs) (laughs) You know what's funny, though? It has the turbo and all-wheel drive. No, I mean, a lot of stuff has turbo all-wheel drive these days. That's coming from U.S. News. U.S. News is like, it's not a very good SUV. We don't know anything about cars, but this car sucks. Yeah, (laughs) and and they ranked it last in its segment. 152 horsepower. (laughs) Mitsubishi's own corporate publications, the kind of rosy businesses booming documents every corporation puts out, aren't exactly glowing. In 2022, the company stated that it had, quote, fallen into the vicious circle of being compelled to offer its products at appealing prices in order to secure sales volume and maintain factory utilization Oh, rates. that classic circle. Bas- I fall into that circle yeah. all the time, honestly. <laughs> I mean, they, they, basically they're saying uh, we don't make anything cool because we're trying to make stuff Money. cheap. Yeah. Uh, and so we'll sell more of it and also figure out what we can make in factories that we already have. So basically they're like, we have no joy left. (laughs) Mitsubishi continues to carry astronomical levels of debt, but hopes its continued partnership with Nissan and foray into increasingly fuel-efficient cars like the Outlander Fev (laughs) will save it. Early returns on the Outlander Fev are positive, although no concrete numbers were given, uh, which makes us believe... They're maybe not so positive. That said, noted disgraced CEO and uh, is he still at large? He's at large. He's in Lebanon. Yeah. Uh, CEO at large, Carlos Ghosn, who was at the helm of Nissan when it started its partnership with Mitsubishi, called Mitsubishi the typical zombie Japanese company. Zombie company. He must have said that from the safety of his compound in lebanon he actually yeah. said it he actually said it in the box yeah. <laughs> i'm doing being shuttled i'm lebanon. being shipped across i'm being shipped across the world right now but hey, i got time for an interview i want to say i want to, on... to say something i want to say something <laughs> mitsubishi is a typical zombie japanese dog. we gotta cast that movie you're telling me yeah uh, zombie japanese company sounds like a zombie like it'd be a cool movie mm-hmm. well Do, um i we think it get, could be joe name? montagna I was thinking Joe uh, Montagna plays uh, Alfred Molina. 
Wait, who's Alfred Molina? Uh, yeah, a Doc Ock in Spider Man Two. Oh, yeah. I think it should be. I think it would be um, the guy from Last of Us. Oh, dude, Pedro. 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 Yeah, he'd this be is, good. Because yeah. everybody's got to be hot in a movie. Yeah, Ian okay. McShane. Oh, <laughs> yes. oh yeah. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. That'd be great. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. That's yeah. going Ian for McShane. sure. Yeah. Oh, that's a good pull, dude. That's a that's strong. I just watched yeah. Coraline for the first time. Is he in that? He's the Russian guy's okay, voice. Yeah. Oh, well, he's Ian also McShane in as Wick. Carlos Ghosn. Uh, <laughs> Who plays Jackie Chan? The guy that was in Everything Everywhere All at Once. <laughs> um, sure. Yeah. Well, who's the who's the blind guy in John Wick now? That guy's really good. He was Ip Man. Or IP man. Oh, oh yeah, uh, that guy's great. Man, yeah, just just get the whole cast from John. Wick. <laughs> from the people who brought you John Wick Four. <laughs> Who's that guy <laughs> that plays that other guy? <laughs> <laughs> the rags the riches story at the heart of Mitsubishi's founding may turn out to be a back to rags story for the Mitsubishi nice. Motors Corporation. Yeah, from its high flying, all conquering motorsport and sales successes of the 1990s and early 2000s. To its current self, basically the car brand equivalent of a two-week-old tamale husk. Ooh, harsh. Strong. <laughs> Mitsubishi Motors has seen a rise and fall that would be enough to make an elevator blush. <laughs> 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 but it's still backed by the powerful Mitsubishi Keiretsu and the Nissan-Renault Alliance. So, is anyone's guess whether the three diamonds can survive the car market's next big push into electrification? I think, like, the one thing that gives me a little bit of faith, and I say I want to underline a little bit, um, is that they seem aware of what they're doing wrong. Yeah. Like, the whole, like, hey, yeah, we're really not enjoying ourselves very much right now. We're just making cars that are cheap, and, like, we don't care about them. We just need them to make money. We just need to use the facilities that we already have. The we, fact that they're calling that out, like, yeah. that's the first step. We got to pay off all this gambling debt. <laughs> yeah. Right. The first step is to admit that they're powerless. I was wrong. They they are coming out with 16 new models in the next five years. Still, it's still uh, that's nine so of many, them are dude. EVs. That doesn't make me, like, make one. Hello, no, my no. name is Blaze Wolf. <laughs> yeah, right. But you can call me Cool Guy. I'm right. from Knoxville, Tennessee, and an avid watcher and listener of your infotainment. Hey. Thank you very much, Mr. Blaze Wolf. I was just in Knoxville. Beautiful place. I don't want to be that guy, but while listening to the first few minutes of episode 179, Nolan was speaking about Jim Clark's ability to ferret out the ladies. Then there is a discussion about why this phrase is so weird, <laughs> and some reasons were given to explain its use. They were really great ideas, but I think I have the actual answer. Ferrets were not hunted, but the hunters. Mm -hmm. I'm no expert, but from what I remember from a random YouTube video a while back, back in the day, rabbits were a large pest to the farmers because they would eat all their crops, exclamation mark. I can't remember the history exactly, but there were people who made a living by training ferrets to hunt and kill these rabbits. These ferreters, as they were called, would carry ferrets with them to farmland, find rabbit burrows, and then throw them in the hole, which they would then chase the rabbit out of their hole and dispose of the little cottontails. R.I.P. to these little dudes. Yeah. As Joe insightfully mentioned, ferrets are squirmy little creatures who would fit perfectly into these holes. And this is now a popular sport still what? played to this day. I don't want to meet a professional fair. Well, I do. <laughs> anyway, love the show and the podcast, y'all. I work a mindless job in the evenings, and this podcast gives me good humor to lighten up and the education to keep my brain moving. Y'all are a great inspiration. One of the reasons I'm so interested in learning everything I can about automobiles and more. Y'all keep me fired up. Best, Blaze Wolf. Dude, sick name if that's your real name. Thank you very much for your your insight there, Blaze Wolf. Dang, that is actually yeah. Huh. I told you. Yeah. Have you seen the video of the guy putting his pet snake in a wall and then all the mice come out? No, no, no that's cool. It, that's the first thing I thought of. Whoa, Justin, it's been a pleasure having you here. Yeah, yeah you thanks for having more. me. You got to come on again. First podcast in the books. Yeah, breaking in the new setup. Yeah, hey. yeah. Heck yeah. yeah. Uh, if you want to follow, please, please follow Justin on, on all socials. 
at uh, Justin Freeman. Yeah, Free not, man. not Twitter. Not Free Twitter, man. Instagram. <laughs> Uh, TikTok Justin and Instagram. TikTok. Justin has a TikTok where he looks at uh, <laughs> car door handles. Yeah, yeah. So my background's industrial design, and you know, one of the major things is how you interact with things, and one of the things you don't think about that you interact with all the time is the door handle. Yeah. So it's really apparent when it's a bad design. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's an important part of your car there, but yeah, you had your your one about the uh, your Subaru. XT's door handle really popped off and now you're doing a bunch of other ones and people yeah. really love it. So it's check fun. that out on TikTok. Follow him on Instagram. Do you have any pictures of Edgar on your account? Oh, tons. Okay, yeah. yeah. Find some pictures of Edgar the dog. Uh, he's a good boy. I posted one today of him uh, me opening up a peanut butter jar <laughs> when he was outside <laughs> and laying down to sleep and then he runs in. He just <laughs> comes into the house. Thanks, thanks, yeah. <laughs> follow James at James Pumphrey. Follow, follow Joe at Joe G. Weber. Juice it up. Uh, follow me at Nolan J. Sykes. Big thank you to our writer this week, Sean Post, and our producers, Gavin Kinzel and Christina Felski. All right. We'll see you next time. Past gas. Past gas. Bye. Past gas. Past gas. Get away from us. Go away. Bye. <laughs>